So a couple weeks back, I showed y'all a little project that my buddy and I were working on. It seemed a lot of you were interested in it, so today we're going to dive deeper into this plastic 308 contraption. While the host of Fudbusters is a lawyer, he is not your lawyer. If you pay him, maybe, either way you slice it, the video that you are about to watch is not to be construed as legal advice. We had a lot of interest in our 3D printed set me project, so I decided to do a little bit more thorough of a video on it. Don't worry, we'll be shooting this guy later in the video, but since this is a gun law channel, we'll be sprinkling in a little of that too. So first of all, yes, it's perfectly legal to make your own guns at home in the vast majority of US jurisdictions. I don't understand why some people seem to think that a gun made on a CNC plastic squirter is legally distinct from one made from an 80%, but I wanted to get that out of the way. Actually, when you think about it, a 3D printed gun is kind of more protected in that it doesn't involve you buying any pre-made, you know, 80% incomplete thing. It has you starting from zero, this spool of filament. So if anything is most protected against the current pending rule changes that we've talked about previously, it would be these. Now, of course, I said most states. However, in New York, New Jersey, Washington, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, California, and now it seems Nevada, all of them have some form of law restricting your right to make guns at home. Not necessarily a categorical prohibition, but something that messes it up a bit. You might have noticed I said you're right. And yeah, that wasn't a mistake. So let's talk about the right to make guns from a constitutional perspective and from a basic human rights perspective. Of course, the Constitution recognizes the right to keep and bear arms, just like the First Amendment isn't limited to the Gutenberg press, the Second isn't limited to any particular class of arms or machinations of making them. A right to keep and bear something necessarily includes the right to acquire it. The right to keep a car wouldn't mean much if the law banned the selling of automobiles, right? Of course, the right to acquire is an interesting thing, as we don't generally have a right to anything involving another person's consent or labor. What I mean can be put a little more clearly. If you've got the right to buy a car, for example, but you've only got 500 bucks, it wouldn't mean somebody had to sell you one for that price. Of course not. You'd still need to find someone willing to work with you under your circumstances. So then if we have a right to acquire something, to keep something, to bear something, what is the purest way that we can exercise that right? To make it, of course. Just as your right to speech exists when you commission an artist to paint your latest piece on politics, it also exists, most acutely, in your own hands. That's why, even without the particular language of the Constitution, I believe we have a right to make guns. From a basic human rights perspective, the right to arms comes from the core right of self-defense. We have a right, as humans, to be secure in ourselves from unlawful force and violence, and thus we have a right to use the tools appropriate to those ends. It follows then that our right to such tools is purest when we make them ourselves. After all, this is the only way that we can acquire them without necessarily involving somebody else's labor, capital, or consent. So the magic of the internet makes a lot of stuff possible. Stuff like my friend and I sitting down and deciding to design a frame for a very commonly available parts kit. We're going to have a talk with my good friend Ivan here in a little bit, but let's talk about some of the core design considerations in designing a printed gun to begin with. The first thing we have to understand is the materials we're using. Thermoplastics. Basically, these are plastics that become pliable at a certain temperature and then solidify when cooled. This differs from thermosets, more commonly used in commercial firearms, which make irreversible chemical bonds when they cure. This is why, if you've ever tried heating up most plastics, they tend to burn before they'll take a different shape. This is because thermosets don't want to take a different shape. They want to be that shape, and they want to stay that shape for a couple thousand years. Thermoplastics, on the other hand, when heated up, get all loosey-goosey and take whatever shape you want, and then they cool solid in that shape. There's one huge downside here when it comes to gun design, though. And this is related to the fact that firearms are tiny machines that run on explosions, which are hot. 
What we don't want is for our new gun design to, after a few bags, get all loosey-goosey and turn into some dumb, unintended, stupid shape. The material of choice in 3D printed firearms today is PLA+, a polyactic acid polymer that we generally print around 230 degrees Celsius. That's 446 degrees in American feet units. Despite the fact that we print PLA plus at those genuine pissing hot temperatures, the thermoplastic will soften significantly at 70 degrees C or 160 feet. These issues are solvable though. In many designs, the frame or receiver is far enough from the heat of the chamber that we don't see those types of temperatures localized anywhere in the plastic frame. Most self-loading pistols, for example, have the chamber floating between a metal locking block insert and the slide, locking up against the slide and generally radiating heat into the slide and the air surrounding the chamber. The pretty pink pistol we're showing right now is my design, and we've fired hundreds of rounds through it in a single session without significant issue. One other heat issue common to all printed guns, which I saw several people kvetching about in my previous videos, is that they are not ideal if you use your car as a gun safe in the Florida sun. The gun will absolutely do weird stuff. Also, direct sunlight exposure will have an effect over a prolonged period of time. There are color choices which reduce this, but we generally prevent this sort of issue with reinforcing geometry inside the frame itself. Other designs, like our Set Me, pose more interesting heat challenges with heat, which we will talk about a bit more later. Before I go on, some of you might be asking, well, why not just print in a higher temperature material like glass-filled nylon? Well, the answer to that is simple. Accessibility. PLA Plus is 20 bucks a kilogram and can be squirted out of a $200 hot snot machine. Fancier materials are not the same in either respect. The next concern is one of strength, both of the material and in the way the material is extruded. There are some great 3D printing channels that do extensive testing on this, like CNC Kitchen, who has a limitlessly entertaining accent, by the way. You should check out his channel if you're interested in this type of stuff. I do recommend it. I'll give a short version here. It's not steel, but it is way stronger against rather than along a layer. To understand what I'm saying here, you have to remember how most common 3D printers work. What they do is basically slice a 3D model into a bunch of 2D drawings stacked on top of each other. The operator will specify how thick these 2D layers are, generally about 0.2 millimeters, a dimension too small to measure in feet. So with this, we get what you call layer lines. Now there is a strength issue here. As you're dealing with plastics which are extruded one on top of the other, the top layer won't perfectly melt into the layer below it. This means it's stronger against the line rather than along it. When designing something like a receiver for printing, you have to take this into account and design it to be printed in such a way as to minimize the likelihood the frame will shear along a layer line. There is a neat kind of cheat code here though, as if you clamp along layer lines, they actually become super strong, which is why some AR-15 designs use a U-bolt in the buffer tower to get that calamitous clamp in action going strong. You also need to be concerned with how the printed parts are interacting with what we can call the pressure bearing components. You definitely don't want to rely on a printed part to incorporate a locking shoulder or to be smashed too hard with a blowback action. We had to deal with both of these problems pretty substantially in our 308 build, and we came up with some, if you ask me, pretty slick solutions. Also, before I go on further, some of y'all pointed out that another group were working on a printable set me receiver, and I think that's awesome. They'd actually been working on it for a while. Like in all things, innovation comes when multiple minds work together on something. This other gun is being worked on by a group called Aussie, and they've done some really neat work. I've got a few pictures up here of their gun for y'all to see. They handled some of the engineering problems here very differently. It seems they've retained the firearm's critical components inside of a steel receiver stub. I don't fully understand it, but I would absolutely love to get my hands on one to check it out. With all of that out of the way, let's bring in my friend Ivan, who I worked on this with, and who's really an incredible innovator in this space. All right, guys, I'm here chatting with my friend Ivan. Why don't you say hi to everybody? Hey, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> I'm sure they're doing great. And so you and I did a bit of a thing, didn't we? Indeed, we did. We did. We did had some fun. <laughs> and here is that thing. So and. I will. I do want to say, you did most of the work. 
like I guess that's true, but you, you provided a lot of uh, very important dimensions because you know pre prior to our sort of foray into this, I had almost no interest in ever building or owning one of these, mm -hmm. and then we sort of I guess you, you sort of uh, convinced me that it was worth worth trying out, and then sort of put our heads together, and now I've got uh, two of them, and I'm probably going to have a third here soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so shooting. Tell me about, in your opinion, what's it like to shoot this thing? So I had a friend who summarized, like somebody asked him to compare shooting FALs. And if you haven't shot an FAL, you can, FALs kind of shoot like AR-10s. And if you haven't shot an AR-10, it's just like shooting two AR-15s at the same time. <laughs> but uh, he, he was asked to compare shooting an FAL and shooting these, these roller delayed 308s. And he said that with the FAL, like especially full auto or rapid fire, it's like a sewing machine that sort of kicks you around. In that you're still able to sort of like control it. Right. Meanwhile, uh, he, when, when he was talking about shooting the G3s, these roller guns, he said that like everything goes black. Uh, the more you shoot, the blacker everything gets. And then yeah. you hope that whenever you stop shooting, you'll still be conscious. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a fairly good summary. Like uh, these guns are fun to shoot. Don't right. get me wrong, but they're they're sort of violent and uh, extremely rugged i think rugged's a good word for it yes in in, in how they handle like the charging handle you know, even with the abutment set properly the charging handle on these guns is like 20 times harder than an ar-15 or an ak there's there's a lot of resistance there yeah even once it's unlocked you're you know there's a lot that you're resisting there uh it, it feels i think rugged is a good way to put it uh it feels very much like a tool right like a piece of equipment um, it is not terribly elegant, right? It's uh... yes, th th yeah, there's a, there's a brutish efficiency to it, right? Which uh, which is something that I actually like. Uh, oh, absolutely. So I, I figured that, and I had heard horror stories about these guns recoil. Like people right. were telling me, you know, it kicks worse than a twelve gauge, and I'm like, oh my god, that's going to be terrible. And then you know, my my first couple shots through it, it was like, oh, this is actually really fun because. Right. Uh, especially especially because these guns run reliably with steel case 308 it sort of becomes like an affordable way just to kick the crap out of yourself if nothing else so it was it was sort of fun to you know go and put my first rounds through one of these guns because it's a very unique recoil impulse i can't say i felt anything like it anywhere else right but you know the the, the gun has been very reliable they're surprisingly accurate shockingly accurate in fact and uh, it's, it's very, very cool that you can sort of have a gun that's so cheap to build that also actually isn't completely awful. I don't want people to get the wrong idea whenever I say that, the, you know, the, the recoil is violent or whatever. It's totally right. controllable. Right. They're, they're, they're fun to shoot. It's just that it, it really reminds you of what recoil is like unless you know that you're alive. You know, I'd say shooting this gun is closer to shooting a Mauser than it is an AR-10. It's it's much more sudden and violent. and but But again... It's enjoyable, and I think it's it's more enjoy. I enjoy this. I enjoy shooting this more than I do my G3 because, again, it's heavier. It, it kind of tames the recoil a little bit more, um, and also there's the fact you know the coloring on mine is is always entertaining. Um, but it's you know it's something you did, and uh, and and that's just awesome, and especially the you know the looks you get at the range when it's. Wait, hold on. Is that 308? Did you print that? <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I got. I got a lot of that. But you know, and I let my friends shoot it, and they and you let some of your friends shoot it, and everybody had a right. great time. Everybody really enjoyed shooting this gun. It's really, um, it's really. I'd say it's a good experience, but it's a, a very different experience from what we're used used to. Of course, one one of the best things about printed guns is sharing them with people who are uninitiated and sort of seeing the. You know, the reactions like you know, it's it's the, you know there's a personal pride that you feel just in yourself mm -hmm. what, you know from a standpoint of look i made a thing that wasn't there yesterday and that that's always good and cool and a very rewarding feeling but there's also something cool about seeing the looks on people's faces when they're like you made that right. and it actually works <laughs> yeah no it's it's fantastic it really is a great thing and i i really recommend anybody uh to to try it so let's talk about accuracy uh so i you know for this video i went and i zeroed the gun and we've got some video of that going on and i only had about 60 yards to work with i mean i could have pushed it back further but i honestly didn't want to like move stuff and i was quite comfortable uh you know be just being right next to my truck but i i zeroed it in and i shot a seven shot group and 
mine and i was like super disappointed most of them were in this three inch cluster right at 60 and there was a couple of flyers and i was like what the heck is going on like could it be that it got too hot or whatever and then we learned something interesting about picatinny rail specs when i got back and i played with my scope <laughs> so there is a standard for Picatinny rail specs. Yeah, different manufacturers really like to roll their own when it comes to their mount. Right. And I think some of it has to do with the fact that there's, like, you know, of course, AR-15 upper, AR-15s being, like, ubiquitous and very right. common, have aluminum uppers. And you can totally clamp down a scope mount tight enough to damage, bend, or deform AR-15 uppers. In fact, I've seen pictures of people's, like, horror stories. I, I think some of, some of what these manufacturers have done is standardize on mounts that, you know, they, 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 you know, the mount bears up against itself at a certain point whenever it's tight enough on the rail. To prevent you from using, damaging an AR-15. Right. And then whenever you're using a printed plastic rail, it won't actually, you know, it's not able to actually get tight enough to fit on a actual made-to-spec. Of course, made-to-spec plastic rail is a little bit of a contradiction in terms. But dimensionally, the rail is correct. Right. It's just because it has a little bit of give to it that it's not, you know, it doesn't hold up as well. So that's just sort of one of the, that sort of showcases one of the things that you have to watch out for when you're designing or, you know, delving into making your own sort of files or projects like this, that just because you're, you know, just because you design it the way that it should be doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, on the other side of things, it's going to come out just right. Well, so yeah, that was, that was good. But so yeah, I got like three and a half inches at 60 I was super happy given the situation, given the circumstances with that. You, on the other hand, have 100 yards at your disposal and have done a lot of accuracy testing. Tell me about how, you know, how that's gone for you. Right. So my, my very initial tests were all sort of like around three inches. Of course, I, the, the, the triggers on these guns are kind of awful. A little bit like nightmare the, fuel, yeah. They're, they're like 10, 10 to 12 yeah. pound trigger pulls. Uh, and, and it's, it's quite like, a like jarring it's not like a clean break it's it's quite right a... it's like it's like squish and then it feels like it broke on oh, more squish oh yeah. is it gonna break oh more squish and oh, oh it went off okay that's and great then springs happen and the gun goes off <laughs> right and so uh sort of you know the, the, the first day that i really went and you know tested things hard you know like i was really really interested in getting extremely good groups and so i took my time on every single shot and was you know concentrating hard on my trigger pull I went and set up a bunch of soda cans at 100 yards, and sure enough, just five cans with five shots, pow, 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 pow. You know, split, split you know, 308 will split soda cans in half, and so that was that was really cool. So I sort of then then realized like this thing's you know, plenty accurate for shooting soda cans, which is like, you know, as far as my uses and intended, you know, my, my intended uses for this, all that I'm ever going to be doing is shooting soda cans at 100 right. yards. So soda cans is sort of my uh, gold standard to test you, and so I was able to do that. And so uh, just just today, actually, I'd revised the barrel spec one more, the barrel mount spec one more time. And so I went and shot on that barrel mount today. And across my two builds, I was consistently, repeatedly able to shoot. It was about two to two and a half inch groups. Wow. And so I was I was you know really surprised because you know, and perhaps it's just my trigger pull has gotten a little bit better as well as this mount did help things some. But the accuracy is generally quite good on these. Right. No, the two and a half inches, like we were discussing earlier, is better than acceptance standards for when these were military rifles uh and i think so i think that's one you discovered that they were not perfectly in alignment and again this is a very fresh design so you tune the alignment better so that things are more parallel and two we're using very high quality u.s made barrels which you know there's a there's a stark contrast here to the in the quality when you're cranking something out for military service when you know that there's a four inch acceptance standard right versus you're making this for the consumer market who like you know us consumers like to complain for almost no reason so i think that probably those two things is is the reason why you know your accuracy uh, and the accuracy of this gun has gotten so so good because if you think about it the original steel receivers will move substantially I don't know if there's that much of a difference, like when it's firing. So I don't know if there's that much of a difference between a regular steel set me and one of these guns in terms of mechanical accuracy. 
Right. And so, yeah, a lot of the inaccuracy from these guns does come, at least you know, the factory guns. Some of that came from the, the fact that those those stamped steel receivers aren't very rigid. Right. And so the trunnion and barrel are able to bend that receiver some, not permanently bend it, but just, you know, bend it just a Bring little it. bit. Yeah. Right. And so that was sort of the design philosophy that I went with. And, and she then, is thick. Right. And, and so, so the, the, my, in, in my head, I was, I was trying to design it to be thick, you know, thick so it wouldn't flex because, you know, as things flex, that tends to fatigue them. Right. You're not, you're not bending the thing all the way to the point that it breaks. It's just bending it part way over and over again will eventually make it break. Mm -hmm. I wanted to design the gun, the receiver, so the receiver wouldn't be wiggling when the gun fires because this sort of ensures that as you shoot more and more and more rounds through this thing, you're not going to be opening some sort of fatigue crack in your receiver that would result in like your barrel flying out the front or your bolt flying out the front or your gun falling in half in your hands. And then you sort of look stupid on, on the range <laughs> and you have to go and like scramble to pick up parts because I've your spaghetti is <laughs> because your spaghetti's yeah. falling out of your pockets. Like, Oh no, <laughs> please don't a... look at me. <laughs> well, so guys, I think that's it. I mean, I, we covered a lot of ground here, but this was such a fun project, um, you know, such a, a great thing to do. I really recommend y'all get into this hobby. It's it's really super fulfilling. Um, as usual, support me, subscribe to my channel, do whatever. And Ivan, my buddy, thank you for joining me. Thank you for, you know, the experience that we've had together doing this. It was a lot of fun. And he also helped me with my uh, with my other projects too. He's a he's a huge help behind the scenes. This guy, um, you know, as much stuff as he does out in the open, he's a huge support to people in the movement behind the scenes as well. So thank you so much for joining me, and thank you for all the work that you do. Absolutely, I'm looking forward to some of the future stuff we've got brewing. Ooh, we got some stuff in the pot. <laughs> all right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Take care.